Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Charts with Dan. We've got a lot to get to because it was a very busy weekend at the box office with both Wicked and Gladiator 2 opening, a combination that the Hollywood trades, the Gretchen Wieners over at the Hollywood trades, kept trying to turn into Glicked. That is not happening, and I don't know if it was ever going to happen, but it was a pretty formidable combo, even if it wasn't quite as culturally significant as Barbenheimer last summer. And let's get into the box office top 10 for this past weekend. At number one was Wicked, which came in at $112.5 million. I think that's pretty good, even though it's a little bit lower than where some people saw it opening. But keep in mind that those outsized expectations of $125, $150 plus million were only the result of pre-sales. Before tickets went on sale, nobody really had Wicked opening at this level. It was seen by some people as risky. Would people go see a part one? Would they go see a musical? I think this is a very strong opening for Wicked, and we'll see how it does over the Thanksgiving week. In second place was Gladiator 2, which opened up to $55 million domestically. Now, Gladiator 2 is a more expensive movie than Wicked. It had a budget reportedly of around $250 million versus about $150 million for Wicked. And I think the reason that nobody is really jumping to conclusions yet with Gladiator 2 is that we have a whole Thanksgiving week coming up of movie going. And people, including myself, are curious to see what Gladiator 2 does over the next week or so. I think if this was a regular box office weekend, a $250 million movie opening to $55 million domestically might raise a few more alarm bells, but because we're entering this holiday season or this holiday window, I should say, I think a lot of people are kind of backing off this for the moment. The global numbers have been pretty good on Gladiator 2 Next week here on this show, as we see what the Thanksgiving weekend results look like, I think we can all really get a good handle on what the outlook is for Gladiator 2 at the box office. In third place was Red 1, which dropped 59% in weekend number two. That is pretty hefty for a movie as expensive as Red 1 and for what you would think would be a family film that Amazon, I think, would want to play out over the Christmas season. That's not a great hold. It was up against some pretty stiff competition, but it's going up against even stiffer competition with Moana 2 this upcoming week. So we'll see how it does. Its domestic total right now is at about $52.8 million. In fourth place is the latest film released by Angel Studios, Bonhoeffer, Pastor, Spy, Assassin, what a catchy name. It opened to just over $5 million. In fifth place was Venom The Last Dance, which dropped 47% in weekend number five with a $3.8 million total. Its domestic total is now at $133.7 million. The best Christmas pageant ever had a pretty good hold. It dropped 35% for a $3.4 million total. Its domestic total now over $25 million. Heretic had a steeper drop. It dropped 55% after shedding a lot of theaters. We'll look at that in just a few minutes. It made $2.2 million dollars its domestic total now just under 25 million dollars the wild robot spends a ninth weekend in the top 10 it dropped 50 percent for a 2.1 million dollar weekend its domestic total is now at 140.8 million dollars conclave is in the top 10 this movie actually shifted back into the top 10 once the actuals came in it dropped 60 percent in weekend number five it brought in another 1.1 million dollars its domestic total is now at 29 million dollars and spending what i think will be its final week in the top 10 is smart Mile 2, which dropped 62% for a $1.1 million weekend total. Its domestic total now at 67.7 million dollars. Overall, this was the best pre-Thanksgiving weekend at the box office in over 10 years. And when we're looking at a, a year that's been as up and down as this year has been, and the downs have been pretty low, I think we'll take any kind of win that we can get and hope that this carries over into the Thanksgiving holiday with Moana 2 opening, with Wicked still being there, Gladiator 2 still being there. I think we could be looking at perhaps another record setting performance for the five day Thanksgiving holiday weekend window. Let's take a look at some of the numbers for Wicked. First of all, it had the third best domestic open opening weekend of the year at $112.5 million. That just edges out Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, which opened to $111 million. It bumps Dune Part 2 down to number five, but it's pretty rarefied air at the top with Deadpool and Wolverine still at number one at $211.4 million and Inside Out 2 at number two at $154.2 million. I suspect that we may see Moana 2 somewhere on this chart next week. 
Looking at the top November openings of all time, another place where we may see Moana 2 next week. For now, unless it gets bumped out by Moana, Wicked is the 10th best November opening ever at $112.5 million. The top spot goes to Black Panther Wakanda Forever, which opened two years ago to $181.3 million. And the interesting thing to look at here is a lot of these movies, like Wicked, are part one of two. So we have The Hunger Games Catching Fire, which was the second movie. Then we we have Twilight New Moon, Twilight Breaking Dawn Part 2. Then we have Twilight Breaking Dawn Part 1, which had a sequel that followed the next year. Frozen 2 comes in in sixth place. Then we have Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1, which had a sequel that came out the next year. Thor Ragnarok is at number 8. And then we have The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 1, which had another film that came out the next year. So as many people as were worried, and I was one of them, about audiences not wanting to show up to a Part 1, and I think that's why they didn't put Wicked Part 1 in the title, November audiences traditionally have shown up in great numbers for Part 1s because four of the top 10 now are Part 1 of two. Now, if you adjust for inflation, Wicked does not make the chart as far as the biggest openings in November. The top spot goes to The Hunger Games Catching Fire at $214.1 million, followed by Twilight New Moon at $210 million. Black Panther Wakanda Forever only drops to number three. Then we have Twilight Breaking Dawn Part 2 and Twilight Breaking Dawn Part 1, but look at how close they are. The Twilight movies opened pretty consistently, basically within almost $100,000 of each other. It was a very predictable amount of people coming out on opening weekend that a very devoted fan base. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1 comes in at number 6. Then with the inflation adjusted numbers, we have Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, which opened to an adjusted number of $165.9 million back in 2005, followed by The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 1, and then Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone from 2001 at $161 million, with Frozen 2 rounding out the top 10. So Wicked did well on its own, but when you look at it in context of being a musical and an adaptation of a Broadway musical at that, it did even better. It was by far the biggest opening weekend for a Broadway musical adaptation, meaning a show that originated on the stage and then became a movie. This does not include movies like Beauty and the Beast and The Lion King, which started as movies, then became musicals, and then had live action versions made. But when you look at musicals overall, including Disney films, Wicked was the only movie in the top five openers ever that was a non-Disney musical. Not talking about Frozen or The Lion King or Beauty and the Beast. So it broke into some pretty rarefied air there. And when we look all time at the highest grossing Broadway musical adaptations, Wicked is already in the top 10. It's at number nine at $112.5 million. That puts it ahead of Dream Girls and a little bit behind the Rocky Horror Picture Show, although that is the official number for Rocky Horror. It has likely brought in much, much more over the years, considering that it screens almost every weekend at some point. So the official numbers on Rocky Horror, probably a big undercount as far as how much money that movie's actually taken in. Hairspray is at number seven. Into the Woods is at number six. It previously held the record for the the biggest opening weekend gross for a Broadway stage adaptation that was shattered by Wicked. Then the top five consist of Mamma Mia, Les Miserables, The Sound of Music, Chicago, and then Grease. Keep in mind, these are non-adjusted numbers. So the fact that Grease and The Sound of Music are in the top three without adjusting for inflation should give you a good idea of where they fall when you do adjust for inflation. When you adjust for inflation, The Sound of Music right now is at about $1.6 billion. That number can fluctuate over time, of course. Regardless, though, that is a billion-plus dollar grosser when you adjust for inflation. Grease is at about $880 million. It was a hugely successful film. In third place was My Fair Lady, which comes in at $733 million adjusted for inflation. Another massive hit. Then we have the Rocky Horror Picture Show at over $600 million adjusted for inflation, followed by Fiddler on the Roof at number five, the original West Side Story at number six, Oliver, which was a Best Picture winner, comes in seventh at $339.2 million, Cabaret is at number eight at $312 million, did not win Best Picture, it lost to a little movie called The Godfather, but it won a lot of other Oscars, Chicago is really the only what you might call modern era, and it's over 20 years old, movie musical that's in this top. 10 at an adjusted gross of just under $300 million. And then we have Camelot coming in 
in 10th place at 293.9 million. So Wicked would need to get to $300 million to make this top 10. Although given its opening, the fact that we're going into Thanksgiving weekend, the fact that it had a very positive critical response, a very positive audience response, I don't think that's out of the question. We'll see how it holds up, how it weathers against Moana 2 this weekend, if people are going back to see it, or if you have a lot of people going to see it for the first time, so we should know more. But I don't think it is out of the question that Wicked could enter this inflation-adjusted top 10, but we're not going to know about that for a little while. So that's a lot about Wicked. Let's talk about the other big movie that opened this weekend, which was Gladiator 2. When we look at director Ridley Scott, it looked for a while like Gladiator 2 might be his biggest opening weekend of all time, but it came in at $55 million, which puts it below Hannibal back in 2001, which opened to $58 million. So Gladiator is number two for Ridley Scott. The Martian is his third biggest opening of all time at $54.3 million, followed by Prometheus back in 2012, at 51 million and then American Gangster another film he did with Denzel Washington back in 2007 at 43.5 million dollars when you adjust those numbers for inflation Hannibal is easily number one it comes in at over a hundred million dollars adjusted from its opening weekend back in 2001 the Martians at about 72.3 million dollars from its 2015 opening Prometheus moves up to third at 70.1 million followed by American Gangster in fourth at 66.3 million and rounding out the inflation adjusted list is the original Gladiator, which opened on May 5th to the 7th, 2000, and comes in at $63.8 million. Gladiator 2 was, however, the highest opening ever for Denzel Washington. $55 million comes in about $12 million ahead of his previous number one opening, which was American Gangster at $43.5 million. So two collaborations with Ridley Scott at number one and number two for Denzel. Safe House is in third place at $40.1 million, followed by The Equalizer 2 at $36 million back from 2018, and then The Magnificent Seven from 2016 at $34.7 million. Denzel's been making movies for a long time, but when you adjust for inflation, the top five are still all pretty recent films, relatively. American Gangster is at number one at $66.3 million, followed by Safe House, which just edges out Gladiator 2, $55.2 million to $55 million. So Gladiator adjusted for inflation is at number three for Denzel. The only new movie here is The Book of Eli, which came out in 2010, which comes in at $47.4 million. And then we have The Magnificent Seven from 2016 at $45.6 million. So as I alluded to earlier, a lot of the reporting around Wicked and Gladiator 2 was trying to draw a comparison to Barbenheimer, Barbie and Oppenheimer, which opened last summer. And I think that the reason that they tried to do that, it wasn't just that there were two movies that were opening on the same weekend. It was that there were two movies, one of which was targeting a female audience, one of which was targeting a male audience that were opening and really kind of complementing each other and lifting the overall box office to some pretty good heights. And let's look at the comparison as far as demographics between these two films because at first glance it does appear somewhat similar to what we saw with Barbenheimer. First of all when we look at Wicked which is in purple there and Gladiator 2 which is in brown Wicked's audience split as far as men and women was 72-28. So 72% of the audience for Wicked was women, 28% was men. With Gladiator, the audience was 40% women and 60% men. Then when we look at under 25 versus over 25, 30% of Wicked's audience was under 25, but 70% was over 25, so drawing a much older crowd than even I would have anticipated. Whereas for Gladiator 2, no surprise really because it was an R-rated film, 21% of the audience was under 25 versus 79% of the audience over 25. And those age demographics, I think, is where you can draw a very stark difference between the audiences that showed up for these two films and the audiences that showed up for Barbie and Oppenheimer. So let's look at the demographics for all four of those films side by side. So here we have Wicked in Purple, Barbie in Pink, Gladiator 2 in Brown, and Oppenheimer in Black. Let's take a look at Wicked versus Barbie first, and the gender split on those two films was nearly identical. 72% of the audience for Wicked was women versus 71% for Barbie. 28% of the audience for Wicked was men versus 29% for Barbie. However, when we compare Gladiator 2 and Oppenheimer, they're a little bit different. 
Women were 40% of the audience for Gladiator 2 versus 35% for Oppenheimer, and men were 60% of the audience for Gladiator 2 versus 65% for Oppenheimer. So Oppenheimer, even though it wasn't a big action movie necessarily, drew slightly more men on its opening weekend than Gladiator 2 did, but still not that different, only a 5% difference. This, though, is where the big difference lies, and that's the age demographic. So let's start with Wicked and Barbie. Wicked's audience was 30% under 25, whereas Barbie's was 57% under 25. So obviously, Barbie was much more appealing to younger moviegoers than Wicked was. As far as Gladiator 2 goes, 21% of the audience was under 25 versus 40% under 25 for Oppenheimer. So Gladiator 2 also skewed older. Looking at the over 25 audience, 70% of the Wicked audience was over 25 versus 43% for Barbie. 79% of Gladiator 2's audience was over 25 versus 60% over 25 for Oppenheimer. So a lot of the coverage that I've read has looked at just the gender divide and said, oh, well, this is a replication of what Barbie and Oppenheimer did, but that's actually not the case. Yes, you did bring in a similar percentage of men versus women, but the major difference, and it's a stark difference, if you look at these numbers, is that this was a box office phenomenon, if you will, that skewed much, much older, certainly than Oppenheimer, and most definitely than Barbie. And I think when you're looking at the long-term effects of this, I think this actually works in the favor of longevity for both Wicked and Gladiator 2, because we've seen time and time again that younger audiences tend to go to the movie sooner, and older audiences tend to go to the movie later. Now, over 25 isn't ancient, but I think that it does bode well for the fact that we may have a significant chunk of the audience that has not yet gone to see either of these two films, and I'm going to be very curious to see how they both hold up over the Thanksgiving week, because if they'd skewed super young, I might think that they were both a little bit front-loaded. However, the fact that they skew older to me says there may be a significant amount of gas left in the tank for both of these movies. And Wicked's box office was the subject of the question that I asked members of the channel here last week. Now, in retrospect, this looks like a crazy question, but I said, will Wicked break Beauty and the Beast domestic opening weekend record for a musical? Some people said that should be The Lion King. I get that, actually. I understand that. It doesn't really matter, though, because it didn't come close to $174.7 million, which was the opening weekend record or second place record, if you will, that was set by Beauty and the Beast. Only 19% of respondents, and I actually checked these numbers as of Friday before the numbers started coming in, said that Wicked would make more than Beauty and the Beast. 81% said it would not, and those people were correct. So for this upcoming weekend, for this Thanksgiving weekend, I'm going to ask another question. I'm going to ask you all to predict what's going to happen at the weekend box office. And the question is this. It's not necessarily whether Moana 2 is going to break the five-day Thanksgiving weekend opening record, because it seems fairly certain that it will. But we're going to add in a little bit of a wrinkle and adjust for inflation. So my question is, will Moana 2 break Frozen 2's inflation-adjusted five-day Thanksgiving weekend record of $154.3 million. So basically the question is, do you think that in its first five days of release, from this Wednesday to Sunday, that Moana 2 will make $154.3 million. Now, if you want to vote on this question, you have to be a channel member. Uh, depending on how you're watching, you may see a button that will allow you to become a member, or there's a link down in the description below. And I've loved being able to engage channel members like this, get them to vote on these questions. The answers are always interesting. Uh, so if you would love to become a member, it's a very low monthly price. You also get free custom badges and custom emoji. And if you want to vote on these polls every week, I'd love to have you because the more people that chime in, the better idea I get of what you out there think about what we talk about here every week. So that's all I've got for Wicked and Gladiator 2. Just a couple more notes for movies that are in the top 10. First of all, looking at the highest 2024 non-franchise grosses, and what I mean by that, movies that are not connected in any way to any prior TV or film property. Red One has moved up to number eight on this list at $52.8 million, so it's moved ahead of both Challengers and Trap, and we'll see how far up it goes. Plenty of people last week said that Santa Claus should not count as a non-franchise property because Santa Claus has been featured in movies and TV shows before. I get what you're saying, but Red One itself 
does not have a direct connection to another film franchise or another Santa movie. Yes, Santa Claus is a character that exists in the larger culture, but this list specifically is for ties to previous film franchises, and I would even still argue that it counts as an original concept for a movie because, again, Santa Claus is a larger figure that I think exists almost outside of saying, like, well, no, he's not... You have to draw a line somewhere, you know? At some point, you could even say, like, well, that movie has aliens, so that movie's not original either. I get it. When I say original or when I say non-franchise, I mean it is not a direct tie to an existing movie or TV story. I also mentioned earlier that The Wild Robot is still in the top 10. That actually ties it with Dune Part 2 and Beetlejuice Beetlejuice at nine weeks. And if it can stay in the top 10 for one more week, it will kick those two off of this chart completely and tie Despicable Me 4 and Kung Fu Panda 4 for the longest run in the top 10 this year. So we'll see how many people go to see The Wild Robot this Thanksgiving weekend, if it stays in enough theaters, or if it's gonna join movies like this. These are the movies that dropped out of the top 10 this past weekend. Anora is out after two weeks. This was its second appearance in the domestic top 10. And then we have A Real Pain and Hello Love Again, which were both out after one week. It was very competitive for what the bottom spot in the top 10 was gonna be, and those movies found themselves on the outside looking in. Looking at the biggest theater count changes for the past weekend, Heretic actually lost almost half of its theaters, 1,608 of them. It's still in 1,622 with two huge releases like this. There were going to be movies that lost theaters. I hate that it lost so many in its third weekend, though, because I think it's a good movie, and I think there's a lot of people now that won't get a chance to see it in theaters. Smile 2 lost 1,510 theaters. It's now in 952. Here is really just tumbling out of release. It lost 1,400 24 theaters. It's now in only 350. Conclave lost over half of its theaters. It lost 1,364 of them. It's now in just 1,013. And then Anora lost two thirds of its theaters. It lost 1,000 of them. It's still in 500. And that's what I hate about the big changeover, the turnover with theaters. Movies like Heretic and Conclave and Anora that I think if they'd been given two or three more weeks could have attracted more attention and people could have seen them based on word of mouth. They just don't have time to sit in theaters that long for people to discover them, largely because most studios just say like, okay, well, whatever. We'll just throw it on streaming. This is what I like to call our road to recovery. The blue line there is the weekend box office average from 2015 to 2019. The red line is the weekend average from 2021 through 2023. And then the dotted black line is every weekend this year. And I've changed this up a little bit because we're almost at the end of the year. So instead of showing what were the highest performing movies in past years, I've kind of marked the peaks and valleys on this chart with how we've done this year. So you can see that early January peak is the weekend that Mean Girls and The Beekeeper opened. The two peaks that we see right around March are the weekends that Kung Fu Panda 4 and Dune Part 2 were in theaters, and then the opening weekend of Godzilla Kong, The New Empire. The low point right around Memorial Day is actually Memorial Day weekend, which was headlined by the disappointing performances of Furiosa and the Garfield movie. Then we have the first big peak there in June. That's the opening of Inside Out 2. The biggest peak we've seen so far this year is the opening of Deadpool and Wolverine. Then we have that peak in early fall with Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice opening. You can see where we were lagging below the average so much in October. So I've marked where Joker fully adieu kind of kicked off a string of underperforming films. And then you can see what we did last weekend. Not only were we well above the average for the past couple years, we were above the average for 2015 through 2019. And that is due to the openings of Wicked and Gladiator 2. And we'll see if we can get even higher this next weekend, this upcoming Thanksgiving weekend, with another huge movie entering the marketplace. We've got so much more to talk about, but before we do, I want to thank the sponsors for this week's show. This video is brought to you by Chubbies. It's officially jacket season, and if you're looking for a great selection of winterproof jackets, vests, sweatshirts, flannels, and more, look no further than Chubbies. The holidays can be all about making a great impression, whether it's at a party, meeting your significant other's family for the first time, or hanging out with old friends you haven't seen for a while. Well, Chubbies has all kinds of great looking clothes that will also keep you warm, whether you're bundling up for a football game or a cozy night beside a bonfire. Even with the heat on, it can sometimes get a little chilly upstairs where I have my studio, and I'm actually wearing my Chubby's flannel shirt right now because as you can see, it allows me to rock my signature look, but it also has the softness and the warmth of wearing fleece so I can stay warm and comfortable at the same time. 
Plus, if you're getting ready to cheer on your favorite NFL team as we start pushing for the playoffs, Chubby's has just launched an NFL collection so you can show your support year-round. Check out the Chubby's website for their best deals of the year. And for a limited time, my friends at Chubby's are giving listeners and viewers of the show 20% off with the promo code DAN20 at checkout at chubbyshorts.com. That's 20% off your order with the promo code DAN20. Support the show and tell them that I sent you when you head over to chubbyshorts.com. This holiday season, gift yourself and your loved ones at Chubby's. This video is brought to you by Miracle Made. Nothing feels better on a cold night than tucking into a soft, warm, comfortable bed, and you'll get that feeling every night with Miracle Made sheets. Miracle Made sheets are made with silver infused fabrics inspired by NASA and are designed to be thermoregulating, meaning that they keep you cool in the summer and warm in the winter. Add to that the fact that they're as soft and comfortable as some of the best hotel sheets out there, and you've got a winning combination. I got my second set of Miracle Made sheets last week and immediately put them on my bed so that now I can rotate out the two sets that I have so I never have to worry about waking up hot or cold. And these weren't free sheets that got sent to me. I put down my own money to get a second set. Go to trymiracle.com slash Dan to try Miracle Made sheets yourself today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo code Dan at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle's so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so if you're not 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash Dan and use the code Dan to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash Dan to treat yourself. Thanks to Miracle Made for sponsoring this video. Let's step away now from the domestic box office and look at the top five films internationally. So this is all markets outside of the U.S. and Canada. And Gladiator 2 actually takes the number one spot, but just barely by less than half a million dollars at $50.5 million. Wicked actually has several key markets where it has not yet opened, and that kept it down just a little bit on its international debut to $50.1 million. In third place was a Chinese film called Her Story, which brought in $16.6 million. It's about a woman who moves to a new town after losing her job and befriends another woman next door who's also struggling. In fourth place was Red One at $8.7 million. And then rounding out the top five internationally was an anime film from Japan called Crayon Shin-Chan the Movie, Our Dinosaur Diary. Apparently, this is the 32nd movie in this anime series. It opened in Japan back in August. When you take those international numbers, you combine them with our domestic numbers, we get our top five films worldwide. And Wicked is number one on this list at $162.6 million. That's just a little bit behind and off the pace for the top five worldwide openings of the year. It comes in about $10 million behind Venom The Last Dance for that number five spot. We'll see how it does as it continues to expand into new markets. Gladiator 2 had an increase of 21.3% because we added in its domestic opening. So it has a $105.5 million worldwide weekend. Its total worldwide gross is now at $220.3 million. Red One dropped 55.1% worldwide from last weekend and brought in 21 $1.9 million. Its worldwide total is only at about $118 million. And again, that's just not going to get it done for a movie at that price point. I don't care what other people say. Her story is at number four at $16.6 million. It's banked $20.7 million so far because it opened a little bit ahead of the weekend. And then we have Venom The Last Dance, which brought in another $11.6 million. It's a 52.6% drop from the previous weekend. Its worldwide total is now at $456.2 million, and that actually takes it into the 2024 worldwide top 10. Now, how long it's going to be there, whether it's Wicked or Moana 2 or another movie, we don't quite know yet. Uh, but then it could also jump over Pegasus 2 and end up still in the top 10 for a while. But it dumps Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice out of the 2024 worldwide top 10. And we'll see how the weeks ahead continue to play out for Venom The Last Dance. Although if we look at the Spider-Verse franchise, these are all of Sony's Spider-Man films, it looks like Venom The Last Dance will likely maybe fall short of Venom Let There Be Carnage. It's less than $50 million behind it. So if it continues to hold well, it could just barely get above that half billion dollars from Let There Be Carnage back in 2021. But it's not going to break that top 10. It's not going to get close to that $681.1 million that was brought in by Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse. 
Alrighty, let's dive down a little bit deeper into this past weekend and look at some of the specialty charts. And we will start with the per theater averages for November 22nd through 24th. Wicked was number one. It brought in an average of $28,937 per theater in 3,888 theaters. In second place was Flow, which only played in two theaters. It brought in $25,406 per theater. Flow is an animated film from Latvia about a cat who goes on a wild adventure, and it's emerged as a dark horse contender, maybe not to win, but to be nominated for Best Animated Feature at the Oscars. So if you try to see every Oscar movie, Flow is a movie you might want to get on your radar. In third place is a documentary called Sabbath Queen, which was recorded across 20 years following a rabbi turned drag queen who founded his own congregation. It brought in $17,500 in one theater. Then we have Gladiator 2, which brought in $15,403 in each of its 3,573 theaters on average. And then playing in one theater was the documentary Porcelain War, which brought in $11,370. Looking at the top films in limited release, which I define as 1,000 theaters or fewer, is a pretty quiet weekend on this box office circuit. At number one was the live stream of Tosca from the Metropolitan Opera, which brought in just over a million dollars. Then we have Hello, Love Again, the film from the Philippines that had a fantastic opening last weekend. It brought in another $931,000. It lost just four theaters from its opening weekend. In third place is a film from India called Sukshma Darshini. I hope I got that right. It was in an unknown number of theaters and brought in around $148,000. It is in the Malayalam language about a group of neighbors who suspect a new arrival in the neighborhood. Then in fourth place is a film from India in the Telugu language called Mechanic Rocky, which brought in just over $70,000. It's an action film about a mechanic battling local gangsters. And then in fifth place is the movie All We Imagine is Light, which brought in just over $60,000 in 19 theaters. This is another movie that could be contending come Oscar time. Looking at the 2024 fall holiday box office, so these are all the releases post Labor Day to the end of the year. We have two new entries. No surprise, it's the two big movies that just opened. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice is still number one at $294 million, followed by The Wild Robot at $140.8 million and Venom the Last Dance at $133.7, although I think they're both going to get bumped down next week by Wicked, which opens in fourth place at $112.5 million. Smile 2 gets bumped down one spot to number five, with Transform Transformers 1 and Joker Folie A Deux both getting bumped down one spot as well. Gladiator 2 enters the chart at number 8. I think it will be the 5th entry or perhaps 6th following Moana 2 at over $100 million on this chart. Terrifier 3 gets bumped down 2 spots to number 9. Red 1 gets bumped down to number 10. And Speak No Evil and Conclave get bumped off of the fall holiday box office chart altogether. Before we look at the streaming numbers, I want to take a look back at a weekend in box office history. And this is actually a very important weekend for me personally. This is the three-day Thanksgiving weekend for November 24th to the 26th, 1995, which was the opening weekend of Toy Story. It opened to $29.1 million, and I'm including the adjusted figures below now, which would be an adjusted number of $60.3 million. In second place was GoldenEye, which was in its second week of release and brought in 30.9% for 18 Point one million dollars adjusted for inflation that would be 37.5 million and then in third place was the third weekend of ace ventura when nature calls which dropped 30.9 percent identical to goldeneye for 13.4 million adjusted for inflation that would be 27.9 million and the reason that that is so special to me is that i remember that thanksgiving weekend 1995 because i went with my uncle charlie to see all three of those movies on the same day. I think I might have already seen two of them. I'd already seen Goldeneye and Ace Ventura, but we loved going to the movies together. And that was a super movie marathon day. We took the whole family to go see Toy Story uh, that night. And it's actually a story that I talked about on a podcast I did with Greg Alba, who you may know from The Real Rejects. We talked for a couple of hours about movies and all that kind of stuff. So if you wanna know more about me and my history and what I love about movies and things like this crazy weekend with my uncle, uh, go check out The Real Rejects channel because uh, it was a really, really fun talk that I had with Greg. Rounding out this top five was Money Train, which opened to $10.6 million for an adjusted total of $21.9 million. And then rounding out the top five was Casino from Martin Scorsese, which brought in $9.9 .9 million. That's an adjusted total of $20.6 million.
And one of the reasons I'm putting the adjusted total on that graphic now is because I also like to ask trivia questions and I'm starting to fold in some trivia questions to the box office flashback segment. And this one is tied with Toy Story, which was the first Pixar film to hit theaters. And here's this week's question. Since 1995, Pixar has only had four films that did not open at number one domestically in their first weekend of wide release. Some open and limited release. I'm talking about opening and wide release. Now this excludes COVID streaming releases like Soul and Turning Red. What are those four films? I'll give you a minute to think about it. Pause the video if you want to. What are the four Pixar films that did not open at number one domestically in their first weekend of wide release? And here come the answers. One of them was Lightyear, which opened at number two behind the second weekend of Jurassic World Dominion. Another one was The Good Dinosaur, which opened at number two behind the second week of The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 2. Elemental opened at number two behind the opening weekend of The Flash. And then this might surprise some people because it was a huge hit. Inside Out actually did not open at number one. It opened at number two behind the second weekend of Jurassic World, but then went on to do very, very well at the box office. I think that Inside Out is the only movie of these four that you could say was an absolute bona fide box office success, even though Elemental did well in the weeks and held on well. It didn't quite reach the height of a movie like Inside Out. So that's what I have as far as the box office. Let's take a look quickly before we go at the streaming numbers. And we're gonna start with the latest numbers we got from Netflix. We're gonna get some new ones later today, but this is especially interesting because we have the numbers from the Jake Paul, Mike Tyson fight, which was a supremely disappointing live event, both on an execution standpoint from the fighters and also because Netflix obviously did not quite have the technical capabilities to consistently stream uh, a an event of that size. They've really got to get uh, their game together and their act together before they start doing WWE and NFL stuff in the coming weeks and months. But this was a massive viewership number. So looking at the number for the Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson fight, which was the most viewed program on Netflix for the week of November 11th through the 17th, 224.8 million hours watched for a total view time of 46.64 million views. That's one of the biggest numbers I've ever seen on the Netflix charts. And keep in mind, that's not necessarily the number of people that watch the Jake Paul Mike Tyson fight itself. That's the number of hours watched divided by the total length of the event, which I think was over four hours. It's likely that a substantially higher number of people didn't watch the rest of that and only watched the Jake Paul Mike Tyson fight. That could have been 60, 70, 80 million people but the official number from Netflix as far as hours watched versus the entire duration of the event is 46.64 million. And we'll look at that number a little bit closer in just a second. In second place was the debut of Hot Frosty, which I think I mentioned here on this show. I checked it out. You know, it's it's it was interesting. It wasn't quite as crazy as I hoped it'd be. It brought in 16 million views. Then we have the Netflix original film Meet Me Next Christmas at 11.78 million views. The Netflix movie Let Go is in fourth place at 9.98 million views. Debuting at number five was The Cage Season 1, which is a series from France about an aspiring MMA fighter who gets his big break. In sixth place was The Lost Children, which brought in 7.86 million views. The Lost Children is a movie from Colombia about a group of kids stranded in the jungle following a plane crash who have to survive the elements. Arcane Season 2 is in seventh place. It brought in 7.37 million views. This was for the second act of Arcane Season 2. The third act was just released. I know I said I was going to review those. Uh, life can get kind of crazy, but I still do want to talk about the second season because I thought it was very interesting a bit of an up and down season. In eighth place was the return of Cobra Kai season six. This was its latest drop of episodes. It comes in at 7.367 million views. Then we have Minions, The Rise of Gru at 6.96 million views and Alita Battle Angel rounding out the top 10, two films that were not Netflix originals at 6.2 million views. And I mentioned that huge viewership number for the Jake Paul, Mike Tyson fight. As far as debuts, and we're talking about in millions of views for any programming this year, Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson takes the cake. It's 46.64 million views over its first week and really first day or two of release is bigger than the number of people that watched Bridgerton season three's debut at 45.05 million views. Beverly Hills Cop Axel F is in third place. It brought in 41 million views in its first week. 
Under Paris is in fourth. It brought in 40.91 million views its debut week. And then Fool Me Once is in fifth at 37.13 million views on its debut week. And as far as total weekly views, regardless of when something was released, Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson brought in the second most weekly views. It does come in, however, behind the second week of release for Damsel. Damsel brought in 50.85 million views in its second week. That's better than Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson at 46.64 million. We'll see what those numbers are this upcoming week. It's going to be interesting to see whether these live events from Netflix are heavily, heavily weighted towards when the event is actually happening or how many people might go back afterwards and watch it. And I think Netflix is going to be interested in seeing those numbers too, as well the executives at NFL and WWE. The third best weekly view number was Bridgerton Season 3's debut at 45.05 million views, followed by Beverly Hills Cops debut at 41 million views and Under Paris in its debut week at 40.9 million views. Let's move on now to the numbers from Nielsen. Now, these are not global numbers, as we see with Netflix. These are domestic numbers only, and they're delayed by about a month because that's how long it takes Nielsen to crunch all this data. And we'll start with the top 10 streaming movies for the week of October 21st through the 27th, so as we approach Halloween. At number one was the Netflix original film Woman of the Hour at 10.8 million hours watched, followed by Kung Fu Panda 4, which debuts at number two at 8.3 million hours watched, and then the Netflix original film Don't Move, which opens at 7.5 million hours watched in third place. Then we have Sing at number four, Inside Out 2 at number five, The Nightmare Before Christmas, no surprise, as we head to Halloween at number six. Traps debut on Max comes in at number seven at 3.9 million hours watched, followed by Bad Boys Ride or Die at number eight. Hocus Pocus returning to the chart, no shocker there, with 3.6 million hours watched at number nine. And then the Netflix original film The Shadow Strays at number 10. Looking at the most watched streaming shows for October 21st to the 27th, The Lincoln Lawyer is at number one with 33.8 million hours watched, but Lost moves up to number two. It, I think, rotated back onto Netflix and a lot of people watching that show 17.2 million hours watched. Bob's Burgers comes in third place, followed by Love is Blind and Grey's Anatomy. Family Guy is in sixth, followed by Bluey at number seventh. The Tyler Perry series Beauty in Black debuts on the chart at number eight at 12.3 million hours watched, followed by SpongeBob SquarePants at number nine and hitting the chart again, a perennial favorite, NCIS at 9.85 million hours watched. These are the top 10 Nielsen shows as far as watch time per available episode. So when you take the total number of hours watched and divide it by the number of episodes that are available to watch, at number one was the Netflix docuseries, This is the Zodiac, which brought in 2.11 million hours of watch time for each of its three episodes. Then we have Beauty in Black. It had eight episodes available that week for 1.54 million hours watched per episode. In third place was Escape at Dan Amora, which I believe originally was a Showtime series. It came out a couple years ago. It hit Netflix and brought in 1.2 million hours watched per episode. Then we have Territory on Netflix, which brought in 1.19 million hours watched per episode. And The Lincoln Lawyer, which brought in 1.13 million hours watched per episode. So five shows there in that top five above 1 million hours watched per episode. That's pretty good. Monsters Lyle and Eric Menendez comes in at number six, followed by Tulsa King at number seven, Outer Banks at number eight, Only Murders in the Building at number nine, and Love is Blind at number 10. Agatha All Along, once again, did not make the overall Netflix top 10 as far as original programming, so I don't have the number for it as far as watch time per episode. I think last week I said that this would have been the finale week, the 21st the 27th. That's not true. This next week that we're going to talk about, which would be the last week of October, would be the Agatha finale week. And it had two new episodes. So I think it's very probable that we will get to see Agatha all along on these charts one more time, but we'll have to wait and see what the numbers say next week. A couple of quick adjustments to the 2024 most watched streaming series overall. First of all, when we look at the most watched library streaming series, so non-original shows, Bob's Burgers moves up into the top five. This show has really come on strong along with Family Guy because of an adjustment in measurement that allowed Nielsen to measure the watch time on Hulu shows more accurately. Bob's Burgers now at five. That moves Young Sheldon down to number six. The rest of the top 10 remains the same, and we'll see if there are any shows that have that momentum to enter the overall most watched streaming series of the year. And looking at the most watched original series of the year, the top five remains the same. Bridgerton, Love is Blind, Fallout, the boys and fool me once but monsters the lyle and eric menendez story moves up to number six moving evil down to number seven
And that wraps up the show for this week. As we enter the Thanksgiving week here in the U.S., there are a few options that are hitting theaters. The big one, of course, is Moana 2, and we'll see if it can continue to rewrite the record books. We had a great pre-Thanksgiving weekend. Let's see what the Thanksgiving week looks like at the box office. Opening and limited release are a few films that I think are of interest for people that like to follow the awards scene. First of all is The Seed of the Sacred Fig, which is from Iranian director Mohammad Rasulov, who had to flee to Germany, actually, following news of this film's release. It's about a judge in Iran who finds that his family life and the obligations, what the government expects him to do, are in direct conflict. Germany is submitting The Seed of the Sacred Fig as its film for the Best International Feature at the Oscars. The film also received a special award at the Cannes Film Festival. Opening and limited release is a film called Maria, although you'll more likely see it when it hits Netflix on December 11th. This is from director Pablo Lorraine, whose last film was El Conde. I believe that picked up an Oscar nomination or two. Angelina Jolie plays opera singer Maria Callas, and it's meant to be the last of a trilogy of films for Pablo Lorraine, profiling prominent women in the 20th century. The first two movies were Jackie and Spencer. Both of those films led to best actress nominations for their leads natalie portman for jackie kristen stewart for spencer and angelina jolie is getting some hefty buzz as well for the academy awards so we'll see if maria can make it three for three and then opening and limited release on wednesday is queer which is from a24 it's the second film this year from director luca guadagnino after challengers daniel craig plays an expat american living in mexico who becomes fascinated with a younger man played by drew starkey i've actually had a chance to see this because i am part of a few different critics groups i have to say daniel craig is really good in this movie it opens in limited release this week it goes wide on december 13th and that's all i've got for the show a bit supersized because we had so many numbers to go over and i expect a similarly supersized show next week as we go over the thanksgiving box office what moana 2 does here domestically as well as around the world how does wicked hold up how does gladiator 2 hold up there are so many questions to answer and fun numbers to crunch it's fun for me at least thank you so much for watching the channel i'll be back a couple more times this week with some other videos uh, before the thanksgiving holiday and of course right back here next week with the latest numbers be sure to check out the description below to find out more about our sponsors and also to find out how to become a member of the channel if you want to vote in those polls. But of course, most of all, thank you for watching this episode. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you then. Bye.